how to increase our Iman. The most common question I receive from Muslims from all around the world. My Iman is low. It's going down. How to increase my Iman? And it is, of course, a question which should be important to each and every one of us. Because for us to die in a state of low Iman is very dangerous. That is a very bad sign for what is to come. Ideally, the best way to die is to die in a state of high Iman. When Iman is at its peak, this is the state we want to be able to leave this world in. We should be striving to leave this world in that state. And for many of us, this issue of increasing Iman seems so complex, so difficult, so philosophical, so complicated that we can't find the means ourselves. When in fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ad-Din Yusr. The religion is easy. It's not complicated. Our concept of God is simple. It's not like Christianity where, you know, God has a f father, he had a son, Holy Ghost, three gods in one. God the Father is God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Yet, God the Son was praying to him and sits beside him in the heavens now. But he's the same. This is mind-boggling. This is weird philosophy. So to f figure out anything after that, if you don't know... <laughs> who God is, if God is so complicated to you, then how do you figure out anything after that? What do you do with the rest of your religion? So it boils down to just salvation. You believe, you are saved. Otherwise, it's just too complicated. Whereas in Islam, Alhamdulillah, we believe in the same God of Jesus. The same God of Moses, Abraham, of Adam. One God. Simple. No relatives, just one God. And He is the only one that we worship. Simple. No intermediaries, no special friends who will do favors for you. No, you have to go to him directly. That's the simplicity. Ad-Dinu Yusr. It is simple to understand. Its principles are made simple by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it is the truth. The truth is simple. The truth is self-evident. It's not complicated. So when we go back and look at the issue of how to increase my Iman, especially in these times where we have so many challenges, whether political or social, ideological, economical, whatever, so many challenges. The solution remains the same. It doesn't change. What it took to increase Iman in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in the time of Isa Alayhi Salam, in the time of Musa and the Anbiya Alayhi Salam, 
is the same thing it takes to increase Iman now. Our times are not special. No more special than they were in the time of the Sahaba or the time of Prophet Isa, etc. The formula is a very simple formula. Increase good deeds, increase Iman. Decrease bad deeds, increase Iman. Simple. You want to increase Iman? Do more good. Give up evil. Simple. And this is the month which is supposed to help us achieve that goal. To help strengthen that awareness and consciousness that we live in an environment where there is plenty of opportunity to do good, where there's plenty of opportunity to give up evil, it is there. Wherever we are, that opportunity is there for us. Simple formula. Do more good. So, how do we turn that into practical terms? Very simple. When we get up in the morning, or at the time of suhoor, we think about some good we can do today. What happens is that we just make the suhoor, we eat, we go pray, and we go to sleep, and then we go to work, and blah, blah. We don't stop to think. What good can we do today? Now, we say it's automatic, you know, there should be good somewhere, somehow, we should be able to, but, you know, as they say, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Simple. If you fail to make a plan about doing some good, then the likelihood is you become so busy with all of the requirements of your job situation, you're out there and all the things that are going on around you, you forget it. Then comes iftar and you say, ah, I didn't do any good today. A day is gone. A day which we can't bring back. It's gone. We missed the chance. So, it's very simple. And even if you missed it at suhoor, it doesn't mean it's gone all day. As long as we haven't hit iftar, we still have the chance. So, that is something we should take away from today. On our way back home, when we get back home, think, reflect. What good can I do today? What good deed or deeds can I do today? And a good deed, of course, is not necessarily a deed which is good for us. Because we don't judge things simply by whether it's good for us or not good for us. Right? We judge things according to what is pleasing to Allah. Simple criterion. That's what the real good is. Real good is whatever is pleasing to Allah. So, we just have to reflect on something we can do today. Maybe even plan for the days to come. To start something that you can do regularly every day, that's wonderful. That's the best kind of good deed. Not one every day you have to sit and think it's suhoor, but one which you have thought out, you put it in place, and every day you're there doing it. Good deeds. Very simple. And of course, among the good deeds of Ramadan is the reading of the Quran. It's one of the good deeds. Now, Prophet Muhammad didn't say to us, you need to read Quran in Ramadan. He didn't say to us, if you read the whole Quran in Ramadan, you will get this reward, that reward, a house in Jannah, etc. No, he didn't. No hadith like that. If you heard it, you know it's false. 
It's fake. No such hadith. He revised the Quran in Ramadan with Jibreel. But Allah connected the two. Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. The month of Ramadan in which Allah revealed the Quran. Allah linked the two together. And the essence, the foundation of our deen is the word of Allah. Nothing more basic than that. That is the essence of Islam. What Allah said to us. The Quran is Allah speaking to us. And we need to understand the Quran that way. It's not a storybook. A lot of non-Muslims, when they pick up the Quran, they start reading in it. They find it going here, there, and everywhere. This book is confusing. As it's translated, obviously. It's confusing. It's not a real book. Because they're used to reading the Bible, which is a bunch of stories. It's a storybook. Story after story after story. With great details about these stories. And that's what they're used to. So when they pick up the Quran, and most books, when you, you get it, if it's a, you know, a book with some kind of a message, not a science book, but a book with some kind of a message, it's a story. It's coming in some kind of story form. We're used to stories. From we're children, what do we like? Bedtime story. Huh? As what kind of books do we like to read? Books with stories in it. That, we, we're raised on that. We are inclined to stories. So when they pick the book up, it's not following the story pattern. They say, this is confusion. I'm expecting a story. I'm looking for a story. I mean, yes, there is the story of Prophet Yusuf. It's there, one story. But is there another chapter that we can say that whole chapter is a story? One story? Can't find it. So then what? This is the point that is lost on many. That the Quran is talking to us. It is Allah speaking to us. He is communicating with us. And just as when... You sit down and communicate. If you listen to two people talking, do they talk in stories? They sit down for half an hour and they just tell one big long story? No. They will start something, then something else comes up, and this one adds this one and that one. Adds. That's how we speak. We don't speak in stories. But this is the Quran talking to us. So Allah talks to us and to all of our needs, whether psychological, whether emotional, whether spiritual, whether material, Allah talks to us through the Quran. This is the word of Allah. So what better foundation for our faith than Allah God Almighty speaking to us directly. That is the Quran. But unfortunately, for most of us, we haven't grasped that. The Quran is a book of barakah. It's a barakah book. You read it for the 10 hasanat you get for every letter. It's not about communication. You're not thinking in those terms. You're just thinking about hasanat. And it's a good thing to think about hasanat. It's not bad. But if thinking about hasanat causes you to miss out on the real message of the Quran, then that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous. We have misplaced our connection with the Quran. It's be become misplaced. We are focusing on the wrong things. And that's why for most of us, the Quran 
remains for 11 months on the top of the shelf. We keep it the highest point above all the other books. We put it on the top of the shelf. That's where the dust collects. At the end of the 11 months, when Ramadan comes around, we take it off, we blow off the dust. We sit down, we start reading it for the Hasanat. We read the whole Quran in Ramadan. If we can do it two times, we feel even better. You know, the more the merrier. But what Allah had to say to us, we didn't grasp. It went over our heads. For most of us who don't understand Arabic, we don't even understand what is being said there. We've learned how to parrot the Arabic alphabet and its letters and read it. But we have no idea what Allah is saying. And even for Arabs, we might think, oh, but the Arabs are so fortunate. They, you know, they understand. But actually, they're just reading it fast too. They're not even thinking about it either. They're just reading, 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 reading. Because the, the goal of reading Quran in Ramadan has become completing Quran in Ramadan. It's the completion. Why? For those hasanat, the 10 for every letter. You add up how many letters are there in the Quran? It's a big number. Multiply that by 10. MashaAllah. That's a huge number. But that's not what the Quran was for. When the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba, yes, there are 10 good deeds for every letter you read. And I don't mean Alif, Lam, Mim is a letter, but Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, Mim is a letter. He was saying it to people who understood that the purpose of reading the Quran was guidance. Hudan lil muttaqin. There it is. Right there. Very simple. Not complicated. Again, ad-dinu yusur. Why we read the Quran? Hudan. Guidance. Guidance for those who fear Allah. So what we need to do, we want to increase iman, Let's get back to the Quran the way it was supposed to be read. It's not important to complete the Quran in Ramadan. It's not important. What is important is to read the Quran and receive the message of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to implement that guidance in our lives. That is what is important. Even if all we get through in the whole of Ramadan is Surah Al-Baqarah. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا سُوَرْتُ الْبَقْرَةِ If that's all we get through, know that if we have gotten through Surah Al-Baqarah, understanding what Allah has said in it, trying to apply what we understand of it, we have achieved a great goal. A great goal. So great that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that the one who had learned Surah Al-Baqarah among us, among the Sahaba, 60 odd thousand, 80 odd thousand when the Prophet ﷺ died, he was called Hafiz. Hmm. He was called Hafiz. Today, if you call somebody who learns Surah Al-Baqarah, Hafiz, people say, Ah, A'udhu Billah. That's sacrilege. The Hafiz is the one who has memorized the whole Quran from Fatiha to Nas. That is Hafiz. Don't call anybody else Hafiz. That is the attitude people would have today. But that wasn't the understanding of the Sahaba. The one who had learned Surah Al-Baqarah was called Hafiz. Because Hifz didn't mean simply 
memorizing. F didn't mean memorizing. The Prophet ﷺ said what? خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَ The best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it to others.